So good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Welcome to our eighth webinar uh, in our webinar series, Next Steps in COVID-19 Response in Long-Term Care and Retirement Homes. My name is Tanya McDonald, and I will be your moderator uh, for today's session. I will be moderating today's session from my home office in Ottawa, Ontario, which is located on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. I am grateful to be speaking to you from this land today um, and the longstanding presence of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation on this land. This webinar series is founded um, on the Reimagining Care for Older Adults report, Next Steps in COVID-19 Response in Long-Term Care and Retirement Homes, which was published last year in July, which focuses on promising practices in the following six key promising areas, preparation, prevention, people in the workforce, pandemic response and surge capacity, planning for COVID and non-COVID care and presence of family. And as always, we are pleased to offer this program with our program partners, including the New Brunswick Association of Nursing Homes, CMA Foundation, BC Patient Safety Quality Council, and CADF. So for the past several months, our webinar series has really been focused on the recovery uh, component of the pandemic. But today we thought we would switch gears a little bit and have uh, Dr. Brenna Warshawski from Medical Advisor for the Public Health Agency of Canada come and present about uh, the uh, COVID-19 and f influenza flu season uh, that is uh, coming up uh, fastly up upon us. So I'm going to pass over to Dr. Warshawski for her presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Tanya. Um, a pleasure to be here. I'm coming to you from uh, London, Ontario, which is the um, unceded territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Attawandaron, and Wendat people. Um, so uh, thanks very much. And we'll just go to the next slide. I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to declare. And what I'm going to go through today is on the following slide. So I'm going to go through um, just a bit of an overview of what influenza is and how it compares to other respiratory viruses. Talk briefly about the influenza vaccine and then some uh, uh, planning and preparation for the upcoming flu season, things that you can think about in your long-term care homes and other uh, congregate settings for seniors. And then a bit about what's new with COVID-19 vaccines and other interventions for COVID-19. So next slide, please. So first we'll start with um, influenza and other respiratory viruses, just some foundational pieces um, to help with our discussion. So on the next slide, you can see that there's a lot of respiratory viruses that circulate in any um, given year. So influenza is just one of them, influenza A or B. We also can have respiratory syncytial virus, a number of other viruses, and of course, um, more recently, COVID-19. So a lot of these are, viruses are, are somewhat similar. They mostly transmit by droplets within close contact of people, but we know that at least for uh, COVID-19 and influenza, they can also um, transmit by aerosols by being in the same airspace as someone else. And there is some um, contact transmission as well. So uh, spread by you know, shaking hands or touching a common object where someone has previously touched that object. Maybe not as the main route of transmission, but can be a route for uh, particularly for some of these viruses. All of these viruses can cause outbreaks in long-term care facilities, but um, some of them can tend to be a bit more serious. So as we know, COVID-19 is the most serious of the outbreaks, and then that's followed by influenza and respiratory syncytial virus, which can also cause significant outbreaks. Um, the other outbreaks can, other viruses can also cause outbreaks. They're, they're more like your common cold, but in frail elderly um, people, they can also have serious consequences. Um, as you know, last year, the main virus that circulated was COVID-19. So we kind of skipped a year of exposure to respiratory viruses. And there's the notion that that's making us potentially more susceptible. So last year, we really had no influenza at all. And so we've kind of skipped a year of immunity to that virus. And um, therefore, it's possible that when we see it this year, we'll be a bit more susceptible and it could be a more aggressive influenza season. So that's something that people are concerned about. And of course, for vaccination, the two viruses that we have vaccination against are influenza and COVID-19. So next slide, please. So this is just a graph um, from the Public Health Agency of Canada that shows how much, how little influenza we had last year. So on the left is the graph of how much testing was done for influenza um, and other viruses. So you can see that um, the 
black dotted line with the gray around it, that's the average number of tests that are done each year for influenza. And the blue dotted line, that's how many tests were done last year. So last year we did a lot of testing for influenza, but in terms of the number of cases we actually detected, that's on the right. And so the again here, the dotted um, black line with the gray around it, that's how the average percent positivity or how much um, tests, how many of the tests that we do for influenza come back positive each year. And you can see we reach a high of around 25% in any given year, um, sometime around the end of December into January. Yeah, you can't even see it, but the, the line for last year is, um, it's a little blue dash line right at the zero. So basically it doesn't even register on this graph. So although we did a lot of testing last year, we found almost no influenza last year. And that's because we had all of our precautions in place for COVID-19. And those precautions were so effective at preventing um, transmission they were able to stop the spread of other viruses, which tend to be less infectious than COVID-19. So if you're trying to prevent COVID-19 and doing a fairly good job of that, then you're more likely to prevent the transmission of other viruses like influenza, which is what happened last year. Okay, so now we'll just switch to the next slide just to um, provide an overview of influenza because there's been so much talk about COVID. We just wanna make sure people um, understand just a little bit about the virology of influenza. So influenza is divided into two main types. There's an influenza A and influenza B. Within influenza A, there are a number of what we call subtypes. And those are based on the proteins on the outside of the virus, the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins. And there are many, many different combinations of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. So you can have H5N1, H7N9, all these other types that circulate most often in birds or in other types of animals. But in humans, we tend to only get two subtypes circulating in, um, in people. So that's H1N1 and H3N2. And in any given season, we can have either the H1N1 or the H3N2. Sometimes we get a combination of both, but they tend to like um, alternate or, or have one that predominates in a season. And within each of these subtypes, so within the H1N1 and the H3N2, we can also have mutations constantly happening. And so that's why every year we have to produce a new influenza vaccine. Um, because sometimes there's changes in the, um, the strain that circulate because of this constant mutation within each subtype. Now, if we switch to the B side, um, here we have what we call two lineages. So we have the Victoria lineage and the Yamagata lineage. Um, and within those as well, there are multiple different strains because of mutations. And again, um, one or the other, or sometimes both of them tend to circulate in any given year. So that's why in most of our influenza vaccines, we tend to have, especially these days, four strains in our influenza vaccine, one that comes from the H1N1 subtype, one from the H3N2 subtype of influenza A, and then a strain from the B Yamagata lineage and a strain from the B Victoria lineage. And that's what's in our quadrivalent vaccines each year. Our trivalent vaccines, well, where you'll see we only have one available this year, um, an adjuvanted trivalent vaccine, that tends to choose one of the B lineages and have both of the A lineages. Uh, sorry, both of the A subtypes. So a trivalent vaccine will have H1N1, H3N2, and one of the Bs, and a quadrivalent vaccine will have H1N1, H3N2, and both of the B lineages. Okay, next slide, please. So influenza, as you know, circulates almost every year, except for last year, but somewhere between November and April, it tends to arrive in the community and then cause disease for about two or three months and then subside. And the symptoms are a sudden onset of fever, headache, cough, runny nose, sore muscles, um, feeling very tired um, and sore throat. And you tend to feel like you've been hit by that truck if you've ever had it before. It's sudden onset and you feel very much like you have to go to bed. Um, the classic um, symptoms do not involve gastroenteritis, so it's not usually diarrhea and vomiting. If you have an outbreak of diarrhea and vomiting in your home, it's usually due to other viruses like um, norovirus or rotavirus. Um, however, young children can get some diarrhea and vomiting with their influenza because they tend to get diarrhea and vomiting with a lot of different things. So generally influenza is respiratory symptoms and feeling very tired and um, the, the diarrhea and vomiting is only in, seen in children. 
Usually it lasts for two to seven days. Most healthy people feel better after that time and are able to get back to their normal activities. However, there can be complications from influenza and that's um, shown on the next slide. So the complications of influenza tend to be um, either pneumonia caused by the virus itself, or because after you've got, had influenza, you can be more prone to bacterial infections um, that cause pneumonia. It can also worsen your underlying health conditions like your underlying heart disease or your underlying lung disease. Um, and it can also cause other complications like ear infections, sinus infections. It can have heart cause heart problems or neurological problems as well. And it's estimated that in an average year in Canada, when influenza does circulate, there's about 12,000 hospitalizations due to influenza and about 3,500 deaths. Most of the deaths are in older adults. So the people as, um, that are most at risk for the complications of influenza are people with underlying medical conditions, um, such as heart disease or lung disease, diabetes, cancer, or problems with your immune system. The elderly and the older you get, the more um, you're at risk for the complications and very old frail adults are most at risk for complications. We can also see complications in younger children, um, particularly less than two years of age, maybe less than five. Pregnant women are at increased risk for the complications of influenza, particularly as they get on in their pregnancy, so in the second half of their, um, their pregnancy. Indigenous populations tend to be more at risk for the complications of influenza as well. This may be due to um, underlying health conditions or potentially access to health care or living conditions that cause more spread of influenza due to crowding. And obesity is also a known risk factor for the complications of influenza, particularly for pandemic influenza. Okay, so next slide, thank you. Um, so here we'll just go through quickly some differences between influenza and COVID-19 because those are the two viruses that we're, we're most concerned about. So the symptoms can be sim similar. There tend to be respiratory symptoms, fever and, and feeling um, very tired and coughing. The loss of smell and loss of taste, that's a, a symptom that's unique to COVID-19. We don't see that with influenza. The mechanism of spread is similar between the two, both droplets within close uh, proximity, so within about um, two meters of one person to the next, but also we're increasingly recognizing the importance of aerosol transmission. So spreading within the same airspace, we, we realize that that's um, a way that which COVID is, can be spread, but we also are now realizing that influenza likely also spreads that way as well. So it's not just being close to people, it may be in the, being in the same airspace as well. And then some spread from contact. So touching a common object may also be a route of transmission, not as effective um, a mechanism of transmission, particularly for COVID or for flu, but it is still important to make sure that the environment is kept clean, common objects are kept clean to prevent that route of transmission. In terms of ability to spread or communicability, COVID is more infectious than influenza. And that's why, as I said before, if we put precautions in to control COVID-19, then we're able to control influenza as well. So we, that's why last year we saw very little influenza circulation. In terms of the severity of illness, we know that COVID-19 can be more severe. So of the people who get infected, you're more likely to get severely ill and die from COVID-19 than you are from influenza. Vaccines, luckily, we're now able to say that vaccines are available for both influenza and for COVID-19, but they do use somewhat different technologies for making those vaccines. Now, antiviral medications, these are medications that can be used to treat and for the case of influenza, also to prevent um, influenza, and those are widely available for influenza. Um, as we'll talk about, we use them um, for prevention, particularly in outbreaks in long-term care homes and retirement homes. There are antiviral medications that are being developed for COVID-19, both for, uh, for treatment and for prevention. And we'll talk about that, um, particularly for, uh, for treatment um, at the end of the presentation. Testing is available for both influenza and um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the COVID-19 virus, and for other viruses. And we'll mention that the same swab can be used to test for all of these viruses, depending on what your lab is testing for. And during an outbreak cohorting where we move residents um, together or I try to isolate them from others, 
is used much more often in COVID-19, but it was, it can also be a strategy for influenza outbreaks. And we'll, we'll speak a bit more about that as we go as well. Okay, so now we'll just switch and talk a bit about the influenza vaccines. So next slide, please. So the influenza vaccine is developed each year in anticipation of the strains that will circulate in any given season. As, as I mentioned, there are we use, choose four strains for the quadrivalent vaccine and three strains for the trivalent vaccine. So what the vac influenza does, vaccine does is it helps prevent you from getting influenza. And because you don't get infected with influenza, it also decreases or you decrease your chance of getting infected from influenza. You also decrease the chance of spreading influenza to other people. Now, the vaccine is about 50% effective. So our influenza vaccine is not quite as effective as other vaccines, but it is um, good at reducing the chances of getting infected by about 50%. However, that does depend a bit on a number of factors including how well the matches between the vaccine strains and the circulating strains. So as mentioned, we have to prepare the vaccine in anticipation of the strains that are expected to circulate in the upcoming year. And um, if, that's, if the vaccine strains are well matched to the circulating strains, then we get better vaccine effectiveness. Now, this has been a challenge, of course, in the upcoming years because, or this year, because we there was no influenza that circulated last year. So it's a bit hard to predict what the strains may be in the upcoming season. The other things that matter are the type of vaccines. They can influence how well the vaccine works. And very importantly, your underlying medical conditions or age of the patients or residents depend, uh, can determine. So older adults with underlying medical conditions may respond less well to the influenza vaccine. Now it's very important to get the vaccine every year, but it's particularly important to get vaccinated in these years where we have COVID-19 as a, a issue as well. Getting vaccinated will prevent what we call the twin demics of having COVID-19 circulate at the same time as, um, as influenza will help decrease the burden of influenza on our healthcare system, will help decrease getting influenza in long-term care homes and retirement homes, therefore we um, the possibility of confusing with COVID, having to test everybody for COVID, it will just decrease that, the chances of outbreaks in long-term care homes. And it will also decrease the chances that um, anybody can be co-infected, so can be infected with both influenza and COVID-19 at the same time, or having outbreaks with both that viruses in the same facility. Because both viruses can cause severe illness, having both of them together in the same resident or staff member um, is likely to cause much more significant illness. Um, there's no evidence that the influenza vaccine has any impact on COVID-19, either for the better or for the worse. Um, and we, we do now know that you can give both the COVID-19 vaccines and the influenza vaccines um, at the same time or any time before or after. So it's really important this year to encourage and support all staff and residents to be vaccinated against influenza once it's available in the, um, for the upcoming season, which is just uh, becoming available now. So the next slide. So this slide goes over the various types of influenza vaccines that are available. It's a pretty complicated slide. So just a key points to take away. As mentioned, we have um, mostly a quadrivalent vaccine available. So four strains. However, there is one trivalent vaccine available. Among the quadrivalent vaccines, they can be made with a, a number of different mechanisms. Most of them are grown in eggs. So that's our standard egg-based vaccine. Um, but there can be other technologies available like growing the virus in cell-based cultures or other technologies. Most of the vaccines are inactivated, except for there is a live virus vaccine that's used mostly in children, the one that goes in your nose, the intranasal vaccine. And most of the vaccines use the standard dose of virus, so 15 micrograms per each strain. However, there is a high dose influenza vaccine that has four times that amount of virus per strain or antigen per strain. So that instead of having 15 micrograms per strain, the high dose vaccine has 60 micrograms per strain. And that's a vaccine that's particularly recommended for adults who are 65 years of age and over. 
And it's important to note that when you're using that vaccine, the dose is different. So if you're using the high dose influenza vaccine, instead of giving a 0.5 mil dose for the high dose vaccine, you're giving a 0.7 mil dose. So very important to remember that when you're using the high dose um, quadrivalent vaccine for residents. And this is the first year that that high dose vaccine is actually a quadrivalent formulation having the four strains. Prior to this year, it was a trivalent vaccine. So because it's a quadrivalent vaccine, it's now that 0.7 mil dose for the high dose vaccine. The other vaccine that's available for seniors or particularly recommended for seniors is a trivalent adjuvanted vaccine, so the Fluad vaccine. The adjuvant is a helper substance that enhances the immune response to try and make a better immune response in older adults where we know because of age, they may not, uh, the vaccines don't work as well. So both the high dose influenza vaccine and the trivalent adjuvanted vaccine are ways of helping the immune response work better in seniors. So um, I, this year, we do know that the high dose vaccine is being made available for all long term care homes in all provinces and territories. So that's a vaccine that you may well be giving to um, to people who are 65 years of age and over um, in long term care residents. Um, and we do know that all the vaccines that are available for pregnant aged women um, are safe to use in pregnancy, except for the flu mist. The flu mist is a live vaccine, so we don't use that in pregnancy. The two vaccines that are particularly for seniors, 65 years of age and over, of course, there would not be pregnant women in that age range, but all the other vaccines are, are perfectly fine to use in pregnant women at any stage of pregnancy. So important for your staff members. Okay, so next slide, please. So now we're going to switch to talking a bit about some of the things um, to, that you can think about or have likely have already thought about with regard to preparing for the upcoming respiratory virus season. So on the next slide, so many of the measures that are um, used to control outbreaks of COVID-19 are also um, relevant for outbreaks of other viruses. So the things that we do to prevent the introduction of COVID-19 into the homes are the same that um, will also prevent introduction of other viruses. So screening um, and rapid testing of anybody with symptoms is a very good way of detecting an early outbreak and ensuring that ill staff stay home will help decrease the risk that um, an ill staff will introduce either COVID-19 or other viruses into the home. Of course, we know that people can have COVID-19 without having symptoms and, and that's an ongoing risk. The same can be true for influenza. People can be infected with influenza without having symptoms. So that's why it's very important for people to be vaccinated as well. Infection prevention and control measures are very important, but both for preventing COVID-19 and also prevent preventing other infections. So physical distancing and avoiding shared items, universal masking um, of staff and also of residents if that's possible. And um, we know that helps prevent transmission from one staff member to a resident or staff member to staff member. And if you have a really good, well-fitting mask um, with good filtration, that can also prevent um, the staff member and or the residents from getting infected as well. So masking both for source control to prevent spread to others, but if it's a good mask can also help prevent uh, yourself from being infected or the person who's wearing the mask from being infected. Also very important to use personal protective equipment around any ill staff or I mean, any ill resident. So if you're caring for an ill resident, ill staff hopefully should not be in the home, but if you're caring for an ill resident, then appropriate personal protective equipment, masking, eye protection, gowning and gloving, and appropriate hand hygiene as well. Enhanced environmental cleaning, as we mentioned, the environment can contribute to spread of some viruses. It's not the main route, but definitely enhanced cleaning of you know, commonly touched surfaces, very important. Um, frequent and adequate hand hygiene, as we know that's paramount for all infection prevention and control and avoiding touching your, your face at all times can also help reduce the chance of transmission. Proper coughing and sneezing etiquette, so not into your hands, into your elbow, and hopefully you'll also be wearing a mask. And then um, cohorting, as we mentioned, can be used in outbreaks. So here on the next slide are some particular things that we'll go through in terms of preparing for the upcoming flu season and respiratory virus season. So on the next slide, we'll talk first about influenza vaccination and booster doses of COVID-19 given at the same time. So as you know, there's been a recent recommendation for um, the use of booster doses, and you can switch over to the next slide. 
Thanks. Um, so there's been a recent recommendation to use for booster doses for long term care homes, and that's being rolled out in um, various homes ac in the, across the country. And it's also so it, the recommendation was for long term care homes and residents that um, are congregate living settings for seniors. So that would include retirement homes as well. And this booster dose is intended to provide protection against waning immunity for COVID-19. So it is possible and now it's um, it's totally fine to give the influenza vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccine at the same time. And that may result in more efficient delivery of both vaccines. It's really important to make sure that there are different injection equipment, so different needle and syringe, and they're given at different sites. And it's really um, important to make sure not to confuse the products, to keep the product separate. So here are some ideas of how to keep the product separate. One is to make sure that um, they are labeled appropriately. So different colors can be used. So influenza can be labeled with one color and written influenza on the label, and then um, the COVID-19 vaccine with a separate uh, color and written on the label. And then always giving them in exactly the same order. So always giving the first vaccine, whatever it is, vaccine X, let's say it's flu in the right arm and the COVID-19 vaccine second in the left arm. So whatever your rules are within your facility, make them very clear and very standard. The first dose is always going to be X vaccine and it's in the right arm and the next one will be Y vaccine in the left arm. Other ways that you can think about that may or may not be helpful um, to you in your homes and keeping them separate are to have two different vaccine administrators doing it at the same time. So one, um, one vaccine giver gives it in the right arm, uh, let's say flu, and the other gives the COVID vaccine, let's say in the left arm. And you do that at the same time. So uh, very easy to keep it um, straight. You can also though, if you'd like to separate the vaccines, if that's um, you know, a strategy that's helpful for you, but also giving them again at the same time and the same visit uh, can also be fine. Uh, clearly document which vaccines were given where is very important. And, um, and of course, when and reporting any unusual or unexpected side effects is also always very important when you're giving a vaccine. And the link is here uh, where you can report the, vac the side effects to, um, or you can contact your local public health authority. So the next thing in prevent, uh, getting prepared for influenza season or respiratory virus season is to, um, to know how to reach your local public health unit or, or local public health authority. So make sure that you know the right contact people and how to reach them, including um, at nights and on weekends, and know how to contact them if you suspect that there's an outbreak of a respiratory virus in your facility, or if you have a confirmed case of influenza or a case of COVID-19 diagnosed in your facility. Until you've gotten in touch with your local public health unit, any ill residents should be isolated, um, so put into their own room, um, and precautions should be used when caring for those residents, so masking, gloving, gowning, eye protection. Um, important to rec remember that in um, residents in long-term care homes, they may not always prevent, present with the classic symptoms of influenza that we've discussed described before or of COVID-19 that we've described before. So they may not mount a fever. So you may have people who ha look sort of just generally unwell. They may not be eating um, as they usually do or behaving as they usually do, or they may be more prone to falls. So those are just things to watch for. That may be signs that there is something happening um, in your home, even if you may not be seeing the classic respiratory symptoms. Um, of course, if you are, have any ill staff members, they should be sent home and they should be tested both for influenza and for COVID and um, to see what and other respiratory viruses to see what uh, might be going on in the home. And you should also start a line list to keep track of any ill residents or staff because the health authority or health unit will ask for that information. And on the next slide is just an example of a line list. Basically, um, it's a list where you keep you put the residents or staff person's name in the, the first column, and then some information about them in terms of where they're located um, in the facility. And then you put their symptoms and any testing that's been done and any treatment or diagnostic information um, with regard to them um, or vaccination information. So you can put that all on the same form and that will help your public health unit understand what's happening in your facility when you get in touch with them about your potential outbreak. Okay, so the next slide, thanks, is um, is to talk about testing. So as mentioned, you can do testing for both the SARS-CoV-2 
to the COVID-19 virus, influenza viruses and other vi respiratory viruses, they can all generally be done on the same swab. So you just have to um, figure out with your local public health unit what exactly they will be testing for. And so when you're in touch with them, they'll help you figure out what you should ask your laboratory to test for in any given outbreak. But generally, at least, um, COVID-19, influenza, and respiratory syncytial virus are some of the main things that will be tested for when a swab is done during respiratory virus season. So um, it's important to prepare for testing if you're going to be doing that at the home. Um, be sure that the swabs that you have on hand are not expired and that there are appropriately trained people that can take the swabs and know the appropriate precautions to follow. So who to call when you know that you're gonna be doing some swabbing, who to swab, how to take the swabs, how to store and transport the swabs, and how to put the appropriate information on the requisitions, including who to contact at the home so that you can get the um, appropriate results back in a timely fashion. So once you've done the testing initially to figure out what's going on in the home, there may well be other testing that's recommended. So if you have a COVID-19 outbreak, it may well be that the um, public health officials will recommend that everybody in the facility or on the affected units be tested to make sure that you know the extent to which COVID-19 is occurring in the facility. We don't tend to do that as much if it's an influenza outbreak, but definitely, if there are other cases that arise, there may well be the recommendation to test new cases that arise because you want to make sure that even if you think there's an influenza outbreak happening in your home, it could be that another virus emerges or, or co-infects at the same time. So you want to keep testing to be sure that you're not also dealing with other uh, viruses like a COVID-19 outbreak occurring at the same time. So your public health authority will give you um, recommendations about what to do if new cases continue to appear and how to test for um, infections in those cases as well. So the next thing in preparing for um, the respiratory virus season is to have an outbreak management plan, outbreak management team. So this means knowing um, who to contact in your facility when you suspect that the outbreak is happening and determining who will sit on their, your outbreak management team, including your local public health officials. To determine how your meetings will happen, it's very important to have a meeting. Even if you've had lots of outbreaks, it's still really important to get everybody together to talk about what's going on and make sure everybody's on the same page. So determine who will chair the meeting, who will take minutes for the meeting, how they'll be distributed, and most importantly, who will follow up on any action items that are, are uh, devised during that meeting. And then it's important to have subsequent meetings as well. So if the outbreak is not controlling itself or unusual things are happening or questions are arising that you need to get the group back together, you need to have a plan to be able to do that on an efficient basis to help manage the ongoing situation. The other thing to plan for, um, particularly for influenza outbreaks, is um, the use of antiviral medications. So in closed facilities or settings where the residents tend to stay the same, like in long-term care homes or, um, or retirement homes, we use um, antiviral medications to help control the outbreak. So these are medications that they don't treat, um, well, they don't, like an, anti an antibiotic kills the bacteria that's in you. Antiviral medications don't kill anything, but what they do do is prevent further replication of the virus. So if you use them for treatment, if you get on them really quickly, they will help prevent you from getting any sicker than you already are. And if you use them for prevention, it means that you start to take it. And if you're exposed to the influenza virus, then the influenza virus won't replicate any at all and you won't get sick. So we tend to use the influenza, the antiviral medications in influenza outbreaks for treatment of ill residents to help prevent them from getting any sicker than they already are. But we also tend to put um, well residents on antiviral medications in influenza outbreaks to help them not get sick if they are exposed to the virus. For staff members, we only tend to use antiviral medications um, if they are unvaccinated, but that may change to, in, in some circumstances. But generally for staff, it's only unvaccinated people that are put on antiviral medications. 
So on the next slide, the antiviral medication that we tend to use is oseltamivir in outbreaks because it's taken orally. There are some other um, medications, but they're not as easy to use. If you do need to use oseltamivir in um, a pregnant staff member who's unvaccinated, then it is safe to use in pregnancy. As mentioned, it's used for both treatment for ill residents, and there it's taken twice a day for five days or it can be used for prevention for the, the well residents when you know you have an outbreak and there it's taken once a day um, for, it depends until the outbreak's over or sometimes it's 10 days or sometimes it's 14 days. Your local public health unit will provide advice on that. The side effects with oseltamivir, um, it's a very safe drug. The only known side effects, the main ones are nausea and vomiting and that can be reduced if you take it with food. So on the next slide, it's really important to start the oseltamivir very quickly as soon as you recognize that there's an influenza outbreak in your home. And so to do that, you should have advanced planning. You should have either a medical directive so that that can be administered to um, for treatment and prevention in the home or the ability to rapidly get into individual orders. So here you need to know how to contact your healthcare provider in the case of an outbreak as quickly as possible and also be able to get in touch with your pharmacist because that's really important to get the medication as fast as possible. So your pharmacist, you have to be able to reach them on nights and weekends and holidays so that they can dispense the antiviral um, oseltamivir medication for influenza outbreaks. Okay, next thing to prepare for is cohorting. So having um, residents um, who are ill, trying to put them in their own room if that's at all possible. If that's not possible, then you take ill residents that have the same diagnosis and put them in the same room. So if you know that two people have COVID-19, you can put those people in the same room if that's your only option. But you would not want to put somebody who has COVID-19 in the same room as somebody who has influenza because they will spread their, their infections to each other. So you want to try to put um, people only cohort with the same diagnosis if you need to do that. And you can also try to cohort the staff. And that means one staff looks after only ill people with the same diagnosis and doesn't look after well residents either on that same shift or at all during that outbreak. So that's something that you can try as well. Next preparation is in terms of communications. It's really important um, for to know how to reach um, the key staff within your facility and then how to make sure that all staff know what's going on in an outbreak how residents and families are kept up to date with what's going on. You also need to inform other homes that you have an outbreak in your home, as well as community healthcare facilities and emergency services workers, especially um, if you call them into the home, they need to know that there's an outbreak happening. Uh, you also have to be aware whether your local public health unit will post information on their websites and then have a plan for the media, whether you're going to proactively go out to the media in the event of an outbreak, or, or be available for reactive questions and who will speak to those um, either proactive or reactive media requests and doing that in consultation with your local public health unit because media will often call the local public health unit and the facility or the home to, uh, to get information. So you wanna coordinate your responses. Okay, so that's um, about getting prepared and I'll just go um, quickly through because I know um, we're a bit short on time and we want to um, to get to um, some of the preparations for this um, or some of the questions. So I think we'll just um, skip maybe to slide um, maybe to talk a bit about the booster doses. So we'll slip, slip uh, skip to slide 25 perhaps. Perfect. So uh, we, we know um, that the COVID-19 vaccines have been working very well to provide protection against um, COVID-19. But what we have been noticing more recently is that there has been a decline in the protection afforded by the COVID-19 vaccines as time goes by. And so you can see on this slide that there's been a decrease in the vaccine effectiveness for um, both Delta strain and non-Delta strain for um, COVID-19 infection in this US study. But on the right-hand side, you can see that protection against severe disease like hospitalization has been maintained over time. And it's because of this decline in protection 
over time from symptomatic infection that we are recognizing that um, we may need a booster dose in some facility or some settings, particularly in long-term care homes and in uh, congregate settings for seniors. So on the next slide, you can see that because of the um, waning of protection against infection, we are also potentially seeing waning in of protection against transmission. So people who are infected can spread their infection from one person to the other. And that's why it's really important that even if you have all vaccinated people in your facility, that you still have to be careful about the introduction and of outbreaks, which can on occasion still cause severe disease and be very um, cautious about still using precautions, including universal masking, because we are now seeing a, some of a bit of a decrease in the protection against infection and severe, um, sorry, protection and infection, we can still see transmission and therefore these precautions are really important. So on the next slide, please. So that's why the booster dose has been um, recommended. Now for people who are immunocompromised, Na the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has called it an additional dose because it's not really a booster for them. It's an another chance to prevent to provide protection because we know that the vaccine does not work as well in immunocompromised individuals. So we're giving them an additional dose to provide protection. And that additional dose can be given at least 28 days after the last dose. But for most people in long-term care homes and, and uh, retirement homes, what, what's being offered is a booster dose. So here we're saying you did have good protection, but as we saw from the previous slide, your protection is waning a bit over time. And we're now giving you another dose to boost up your protection. And what we found here is that Moderna um, seems to have a bit of a better antibody response and potentially a bit more effective than the Pfizer vaccine. So that's something to consider when you're thinking about the, uh, the booster dose, but both will be very effective at boosting. So you can use either vaccine to boost, but slightly more, um, more effective if you use the Moderna vaccine potentially at the full dose, the 100 microgram dose. As mentioned, you can give both um, the booster dose and the flu vaccine at the same time. And the National Advisory Committee is now looking at booster doses in potentially in other populations as well. And what's listed on this slide, you can see the booster doses that are being offered in other countries. So some are offering booster doses at um, 50 years of age and over, like in the UK, um, some 65 years of age and over, like in the US. And in Israel, they have offered a booster dose to everybody uh, because who's 12 years of age and over because of a large outbreak that they've had there. So next slide, please. We also know that there will be um, vaccines available soon for children, um, so five to 11 years of age. In children, it's a third of the dose that's used in the adult um, formulation. And there is a new formulation that will be available for the Pfizer vaccine for children. And we expect that to be available at the time that the vaccine is authorized. And that will likely be um, in the upcoming months. So sometime in November, it's likely we will have um, authorization for the Pfizer vaccine for children five to 11 years of age. And we will have a new formulation to provide that. And Moderna will likely follow, follow um, sometime later than that. And finally, on the last slide, um, we do have some other um, things that are available that we should watch for that may help with COVID-19. There is a medication called molnupiravir, which is um, helps to treat um, influenza, if, uh, sorry, treat COVID-19 if it's given quickly after the symptoms start. And this is something that may become authorized for use. It decreases the chances of a sick person with COVID-19 ending up requiring hospitalization by about half. And then there's another product called AZD7442. This is a, um, an experimental product that provides passive protection against in, um, infection. So in addition to the vaccine, you could potentially get this product that will provide up to a year of protection um, against acquiring the vax, uh, acquiring COVID-19 infection. So in one study, it was 77% decrease in acquiring COVID-19 um, at six months in people who receive this product. So this is an addition to the vaccine and it may be appropriate for people who don't respond as well to the vaccine. So you'd give it um, along with being vaccinated um, or it may be for people who are most at risk. So this is something to watch for. It's not a vaccine per se because it's 
passive protection. It's already formed protection, but it may be something that may be used in the future, particularly for frailer, older adults as an, another strategy to prevent influenza. So I'll stop there. I know that was a lot of information and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. So thank you so much, Brunei. It was a lot of information and we have a lot of questions. So that's great. And we have uh, a good, uh, at least 15 minutes for discussion. Um, so the first question is from Dr. Andy Picard. Um, so on slide 13, the slide that uh, lists the complications from influenza, you quoted a number for deaths due to influenza. Was that number based on death certificates, which identified influenza as the cause of death, or is it a number from modeling studies? Yes, very good question. So that's um, 3,500 annual deaths is an estimate based on modeling studies. It's not based on um, confirmed lab confirmed influenza. It's based on sort of the differential in, um, in deaths that occur in non-influenza seasons compared to when we see influenza circulating. And they use that sort of difference in deaths during influenza season to model the anticipated numbers. Now, and, and of course, every year it could be different, right? Depending, we know that when H3N2 circulates, that tends to affect um, senior populations more than H1N1. So we will see more deaths in an H3N2 season than in an H1N1 season. So it's a, it's a rough estimate of the burden of influenza in any given season. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Mandana Ari. So what document, uh, I can refer to that states flu and COVID-19 vaccines can be given at the same time, and there's no minimum interval restriction between the two vaccines. Yep. So the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, they post their statements and they have um, a general statement uh, that has a lot of this information. And in there, it used to talk about separating the COVID vaccines and other vaccines by 14 days or 28 days. They changed that, I'd say about a month ago. Um, and so they now say that you can give both at the same time. So if you check out the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, their, their main statement, and you look at simultaneous administration, it will say in there that you can give them at the same day or any days apart. There's no, um, there's no need to separate them anymore. Great. Uh, another question from Dr. Picard. Are you aware of any studies on the reaction of people with the dementia to staff wearing masks and gowns? That's a very good question. And I don't have any information on that. I'm sorry, I can't really say how that I mean, I, I would imagine that, you know, the lack of um, facial expressions can be disconcerting and, and, and could impact on on communications, but I, I'm not aware of any particular literature on that. On that. So thank you. So perhaps some of our participants here today have uh, some studies that they could share in the chat box for Dr. Picard. Um, Kay Wright asks, are we concerned about side effects from giving the two doses at one time? So I'm imagining it's the COVID and the flu vaccine. Two sore arms uh, can be very upsetting for some of the residents. Yeah, so that's a good question. So when they've been studied together, um, they've been, it's been shown that it doesn't impact um, the, the immune response to any great extent, so that the immune response is similar when you administer them together. And the side effect profile is generally similar. But that being said, of course, you do get a sore arm from the COVID vaccine and you do get a sore arm from the influenza vaccine. So it's true, both arms will be, will be somewhat sore. Um, older adults tend to get less of the side effects because their immune response is not as um, robust. So it tends to be not as um, what we call reactogenic. They don't have as many side effects, but but definitely you can get side effects from both. Um, and particularly the sore, your arms will both be sore potentially. Um, a question from the New Brunswick Special Care Home Association. Um, as the operator of a facility, my families are looking to me for the safety factor of giving both doses together. I'm not prepared to say it's okay. Can you provide me with data that shows clinical studies completed that prove this is safe? So I guess it's a similar comment to the last question. <laughs> Yeah, so the, there's the one main study that's quoted, um, well, you can look at the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. The one main study is by um, Lazarus is the author, and it um, was done out of the UK where they gave people um, various flu vaccines with both the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine that they use there. And that's where the data that um, shows that the immune response doesn't appear to be impacted. And um, the... Um, 
the uh, side effects are similar. Now that was done after the second dose. So that was, they gave those two together with a second dose. What we're talking about here is a third dose. So there isn't data on that, but, but generally um, it's felt that it's extrapolatable from the second dose to the third dose. Great. And just a comment from Alison Bell that in Manitoba, they keep a box of each dose of the antiviral medication on site um, to start treatment immediately until the remaining supply comes in from the pharmacy. So just sharing different strategies. <laughs> on how to That's a great. Quick. That's a great idea. If your pharmacy will allow that, then you can definitely start your antiviral medications as quickly as possible. And because the antiviral medications need like the quicker you start them for treatment, the faster you will, um, the more you'll help people not get severely ill, but more most importantly, you'll also cut the outbreak transmission down very rapidly. So the longer it takes you to get that antiviral medication, the more it'll spread within your facility. And if you can get those medications in really quickly, you can cut that outbreak um, fairly quickly. So thank you. And just sort of jumping the question queue for a second, because uh, there's a, another comment on the question you just uh, that was just asked from the New Brunswick Special Care Home Association um, about sharing the link to the study. So I think my team is sharing the link to the NACI recommendations. And so potentially, uh, Dr. Bryn, if, if you can send us the link to that study, then we can share also. And also to confirm then that there are no studies that uh, they can give their families showing the third dose and flu vaccine together has been tested. Yeah, not that I'm aware of, not that I've seen. How, um, however, like there'll be real world experience coming out, like the U.S. Um, is is likely have doing it or have been doing it already. So we will be able to monitor real world data on that. And of Just course, we're going to start to do it as well. Yeah. Sorry. And just to comment too that in New Brunswick, the time that it takes between getting a test for COVID-19 and learning the results can be seven to 14 days. So I'm not sure if any other provinces are experiencing these types of delays and results and how that impacts, um, you know, being able to action them. Yeah. I just muted myself. And uh, Dr. Picard also asks that, can you confirm that COVID-19 vaccines are not egg-based? Yes, COVID-19 vaccines are not egg-based. So um, the technologies that are available for the current COVID-19 vaccines we have are all um, a different technology. Or they're either an mRNA vaccine or a, um, an, a viral vector vaccine. The main one we're using is an mRNA vaccine. That's a, a fairly different technology than the ones we've used before in that what we're giving is the genetic code for the um, the spike protein. So we give the genetic code, our body makes the spike protein, and then we make an immune response to that. Um, whereas for most other vaccines, we give the protein itself, like for influenza, we're, we're giving the, the proteins themselves. Um, so because the genetic code is what we're giving, there, there's no egg at all involved in the mRNA vaccines or the adenoviral vector vaccines. That's great. Um, and another question that's come through about uh, some potential anticipation with regards to uh, increased vaccine resistance to the flu vaccine. We've seen that the COVID-19 vaccine can be quite polarizing. Do you anticipate the same type of reaction to the flu vaccine this year as well? Um, well, you know, we know that the vast majority of people have gotten their COVID-19 vaccines, and we know how important that is. Like the people who are not getting their COVID-19 vaccines are the people who are unfortunately getting very sick with COVID-19. And you keep hearing those stories of people who, you know, as they're very ill and, and in the ICU are regretting their decisions about not being vaccinated. So I think that, you know, more and more people are getting the sense that what they need to, um, to get their COVID-19 vaccines. Um, there's generally lower acceptance from the influenza vaccine because people tend to think of it more as a sort of benign disease, but it's not. And clearly anybody working in or, or living in um, congregate settings for seniors, it's very important to get the influenza vaccine every year because you don't want to be the source of introduction of COVID-19, um, sorry, of influenza into the, sorry, did I say, yeah, you want to get both your COVID-19 vaccine and your influenza vaccine. You don't want to be the source of introduction of either of those viruses into the facility. So protecting the residents by both vaccinating them against both and protecting the staff so that they don't introduce either of them. And it's always important to protect the staff because the residents, as you know, their immune systems are not as, as robust as they get older. So they specifically for the influenza vaccine, they don't mount as good an immune response as younger, healthier people. And so by protecting the, the staff from introducing it into the home, you're providing additional protection for the residents. Great. And let's uh, finish on a uh... 
on a positive note in the sense that have you heard of any innovative solutions for making the flu shots uh, more accessible to people working and living in long-term care, for example, vaccine clinics and the facilities and so on? Do you, what do you imagine in terms of rollout this year for those vaccines? Yeah, you know, we've been years and years of um, vaccine rollout. So, so I think in general, the residents in long-term care homes and congregate living settings, they are quite quite willing to accept and wanting to accept the influenza vaccine. And, and similarly for the COVID-19 vaccine, their uptake has been the highest of any age group is the older adult. So um, the challenge has always been to, for the staff um, and that's a challenge both for COVID-19, not as much, but for influenza as well. So in terms of you know vaccination campaigns, definitely there's lots of strategies that can be tried and that have been experimented over the years being so being available for the residents is pretty easy just making sure you have your consent go and providing it in the homes and offering it to all the residents and being accessible as possible um, for the staff also having it in the, the facility in the home um, being available on any shift to give it um, having competitions having your leaders get the vaccine as role models and examples and then of course there are other things that are more of stick like strategies where we know that if you people who are not vaccinated um, cannot work sometimes unless they're on antiviral medications in influenza outbreaks. So those are, are other um, levers, but really education and access and, and making sure that staff understand the benefits to themselves and to the, uh, to the residents. Because if they are exposed to influenza at their facility and they get sick or COVID-19 at their facility, they can also be the conduit back home uh, to their families. So very important to promote both vaccines through a number of strategies, including the ones we've mentioned, competitions, easy access um, and education. That's great. So I don't see any more questions in the chat. So thank you so much for uh, providing this overview. Um, Excellent presentation and uh, lots of great overview about the upcoming uh, potential twindemic between the flu and COVID-19. And um, we thank you very much for uh, spending the last hour with us today. Um, so just for um, the, our participants who follow us uh, regularly, so we have a virtual learning series um, event a webinar on November 15th, uh, Moral Injury and Moral Distress. And this will be uh, with Marianne Notariani and Fardis Hosseini from the Center of Excellence on Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. And also our next Long-Term Care Plus huddle is on October 28th uh, from 2 to 3.30 p.m. And we will be providing um, a Essential Together update policy guidelines for essential care partners, which will be led by uh, Carol Fancott and Shoshana Hein Goldberg from Healthcare Excellence Canada. So thank you very much everyone for listening to us today um, and have a great afternoon.